All right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I'm very excited for today's uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Dave Rosen. I'm the section head of uh, colorectal surgery at uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Fairview Hospital on the west side of Cleveland. And we're coming to you today with a great uh, program. So welcome, first of all, to today's Live from Cleveland Clinic broadcast. Thank you very much to the over 1,500 healthcare providers who registered for today's event across the globe, representing more than 100 countries. It's really incredible. And we want to hear from you. So please interact during this program uh, by way of the chat box. We want it to the program to be as interactive as possible. Encourage you to use the chat box and uh, send in your comments and questions during the broadcast. I'll be monitoring that um, and uh, relaying questions to our uh, amazing panel. Before we get going on this, I do want to acknowledge our, our corporate sponsors for their generosity in providing educational grants for our 2024 series. We cannot hold these CME offerings without our industry sponsors, and we're most grateful for the support from Cook Medical, Janssen Biotech, Medtronic, and Olympus Corporation of the Americas. So thank you very, very much. Now, I'm going to kick it over to my, uh, my good partner, and co-moderator here, uh, Dr. Ajaradu Kashinro. Um, she is perfect to help lead this session as her middle name is Ostomy, that is a true fact. And, you know, I just finished two very challenging stoma cases and I really wished that this webcast had already happened so I could know what to do and get some help from my uh, colleagues there in the OR. And so with that, Dr. Kashinro, I'm gonna kick it over to you to do our, the rest of the remainder of our faculty introductions and get going on this very challenging uh, uh, but timely topic. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rosen. So we have three faculty today that's gonna be going through different aspect of, uh, that you can encounter when you're dealing with a difficult stoma. So first we have Dr. Anvanda Bama, uh, who's one of our faculty members at main campus. We have Dr. Joseph Tronzo. He's one of our faculty members on the west side. So also one of my partners, me and Dr. Rosen's. And then we have Kate Warner, who's one of our esteemed nurse practitioner, who's also trained in wonastomy. So she deals with quite a few of these complications. So the first up is going to be Dr. Tronzo. He's going to be talking about intraoperative dif difficulties uh, that can be encountered in this situation. Thank you uh, for the introduction. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to present uh, on this topic. I will go ahead and share my screen here. So my topic is maturing the tough stoma and um, intraoperative uh, decision making, um, and I, I did touch on a little bit of some pre-op decision making to help with, because sometimes some of the some things that we can do just before we get to the operating, specifically in a non-elective case, will be you know advantageous for us during the operation. So you know the objectives I have is we're going to start off by just just touching on real quickly about some preoperative marking strategy on the non-elective case, and then. Then we'll go into some of the, the nuances, some helpful tips uh, with maturing a stoma, technical considerations, and some other things. Okay, and uh, we'll go through those. And it's obviously we have a short amount of time, but I'll, I'll try to just kind of go through those slides pretty quickly. So stoma marking is something that's we really you emphasize in colorectal surgery quite often about trying to find an ideal position for that. And in the you know the perfect scenario where you know they're coming to the office, they're getting an evaluation beforehand, they're giving you know. Uh, uh, maybe an appliance put on their abdominal wall and we're doing these kinds of things. But what about the non-elective case? And that's the, the situation where we run into where it's not so mainstream. And we sometimes, if we could just do some, some little quick crude things to kind of help ourselves uh, sort of avoid having a troubled um, uh, position in our ostomies. So the first thing, this is something that I routinely do is if I can, if the patient can tolerate sort of swinging their, their legs off the end of the bed, that, that makes a huge impact. Because if you can swing them off the edge and sit them up, you'll you'll, easy, you'll start seeing where the skin folds lie because that's what's going to run them into some trouble. And then if you can appreciate where these skin folds are and make some, like I said, a crude marking where you might find that it's going to help you in the in the long term when you're dealing with the patient in the post-op period when they're having trouble pouching their stoma. So this is something that if you quickly do it before the operation, especially on that urgent case, you're just running them into the pre-op area and you might be able to sort of avoid some of the difficulties. But what about these obese patients? You know, this patient that has a, a rotund abdomen like this, um, you know, you want to avoid those lower lower abdominal stomas. You know, we like to think about left lower quadrant, right lower quadrant. But a patient like this, an infra umbilical stoma is going to be very challenging. 
um, for a number of reasons. It's going to be difficult for them to pouch. It's going to be difficult for them to see. And more importantly, it's actually just really difficult to bring it through the abdominal wall. They carry a lot of that weight down low. So using an upper abdominal uh, spot is going to be really advantageous and really should be thinking about that in a patient with that sort of, sort of anatomy. And I, I bring this slide in there. You know, we look at um, this cadaver sagittal view, and you can see, you know, looking at where the umbilicus is, you know, above and below that area, the amount of adipose tissue in a thin patient versus an obese patient, you know, what that would look like, um, you know, bringing that, that, that stoma up through the abdominal wall, and how much more challenging it'll be if we utilize the upper abdomen where they don't carry as much of their weight. So in, what you're trying to avoid is this presentation. You know, you, ha you brought something through the left lower quadrant. It's retracting now. It's difficult to pouch. And then it's, can it become ischemic and stricture? And this is sort of what we're trying to avoid. So we can look at that in this, this patient. And this is one of the challenging ones that was like kind of harping on an obese abdomen because this has become one of the more difficult ones to bring up. So those kind of tips and tricks are sort of preoperative markings that will help with avoiding things. So now, you know, the, the thing that I want to spend a little more time focusing is the tips in the OR. How do we deal with managing the, the ostomy um, um, and trying to be able to be surgically advantageous for us during that tough time in the operating where we can't bring the stoma up? So first thing, it sounds kind of basic, but really sometimes we forget about being generous with our fascial opening. And whether or not you use a cruciate incision or a vertical incision, which is something the preferred method in which I open the fascia and the anterior and posterior sheath, we do want to come through that rectus muscle. Um, somewhere in the middle, if we can, uh, but be this is not the time to be worried about what the peristomal hernia is going to look like after surgery. You know, may, being generous with that, and sometimes we forget about being more generous with that opening or even the skin opening, because it can always be afforded after the fact. Um, so that's something that we that it's just just that's a first and foremost thing to do. And one of the things, especially we're looking at the obese patient, they carry a lot of extra fat, intra abdominal fat, and removing that bulky epiploica that can be draped around the colon to just sort of skeletonizing that colon of all that excess tissue will make a huge impact when you're trying to bring that colon up through the abdominal wall. And sometimes, again, something we may not be thinking about when we're trying to, we're having trouble bringing that, that thick, heavy tissue through the abdominal wall. But something that can be sort of sort of a freebie for getting, getting extra length or getting less uh, di diameter to the colon as you're bringing it up. And then many times we're looking at transverse colostomies in these salvage situations. And we sometimes forget about how much challenge that momentum will bring to bring the transverse colon up through the abdominal wall. And so again, when I'm training the residents and we talk about that, releasing that greater momentum off the superior border of the transverse colon, even sometimes getting into the lesser sac um, is really impactful with, so you don't have to drag all that extra heavy tissue through the abdominal wall. And it can really, really impede your ability to bring that both, especially if you're bringing up a loop colostomy up through the abdominal wall. So releasing that omental, fully releasing it both proximally and distally to where you're planning to bring that colon up can be very helpful uh, when you're dragging it through the abdominal wall. So one of the things, again, is one of the things we harp on with the residents, you know, we when we're tugging on the bowel, sometimes the residents feel like a Babcock is a, or a, some of these grasping instruments are not traumatic, and they can be, especially when you're using them for the, for pulling and tugging it, they will tear the tissue. And if you bring up a loop of the of the bowel up to the abdominal wall, it very easily will tear tissue. Um, so be cautious with these types of tools when you're pulling up and you're trying to get that that extra reach up through the abdominal wall because it will rip tissue. And sometimes it rips areas of tissue you don't want to see ripped, and and it but makes a difficult situation that you have to salvage. Um, one of the techniques that you can do when you're running into a situation is is you can actually use a small or even an extra small wound retractor and you drop that into the abdominal wall with a little bit of lubrication and we can bring that colon up through the abdominal wall with this technique. But I will tell you, this is a great maneuver. It does work well, but it's not so easy to get that wound retractor off. So you actually have to cut the ring most of the time from the inside of the abdominal wall. So cut that ring off and then you can drag and slip this, the sleeve of the wound retractor up through the abdominal wall once you've brought the colon or, or bowel up through there. So this is a nice little technique. Sometimes we forget about this maneuver. Um, it's actually quite helpful. One thing is, it seems kind of basic as surgeons, and we, we think about mobilization as being an important thing, but sometimes if you're doing a tough procedure, a tough Hartman's perforated colostomy or perforated colon from diverticulitis, and we're struggling to get that bowel mobilized, we forget about really releasing that retroperitoneum, sweeping the retroperitoneum, like especially when we're talking about mobilizing the descending colon, releasing it off the gyrotus fascia, bringing it completely medial onto the vascular pedicle. You'll get an incredible amount of length if you get that kidney down and all that retroperitoneal tissue off the back of the mesocolon, and that'll help you. 
but you have to think about that. And sometimes we do have to mobilize the flexor, and it's not what you want to do in those tough situations, those urgent situations, but and not often do I have to mobilize you know, for a descending colostomy, but depending on where you're, we're dealing with the pathology, that, that sometimes is necessary. But sometimes we have to do that extra step and fully mobilize that colon. And one of the last things that I would do as far as mobilization of a colon where I'm really running into trouble, and this, this didn't protect very well, it's a little just unclear, but um, you know, you can take the pedicle of the, like to say you did a perforated sigmoid colon. You know, if you mobilize the colon, you've skeletonized, if you're still having trouble, the mesentery is really giving you trouble pulling up on it, you can take that pedicle like we would oncologically, and that will give you a, a tremendous amount of reach. There's plenty of perfusion through the marginal artery. We typically do this when we do oncologic surgery. So it is a maneuver you can do. Again, it's not my first move. This will be my last move. I don't like taking blood supply. We don't have to, but this is sort of one of those things you can do, which actually will give you, afford you a lot of mobility to the mesentery. So when we talk about different kinds of clots, we were talking a lot about end stomas, but sometimes with trouble with pulling up a loop, you know, again, avoiding using grasping instruments and traumatic instruments pulling up, utilizing an umbilical tape or Penrose drain, I typically like an umbilical tape to help lift that loop of bowel up through the abdominal wall. It's less traumatic. You're going to have a little more control of the bowel as you're dragging it up through the abdominal wall, and it's less likely to rip and tear tissue. Um, and one of the things about maturing, when we talk about specifically a loop colostomy, people have different different approaches to how they mature a loop colostomy. The conventional way, as you, as you see in the left upper uh, part of the screen, is to sort of that can opener like we do in a loop ileostomy. But my preferred approach is actually opening the colon longitudinally along, along its long axis. And this was described many years ago by some of our uh, so founding department members here at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Rupert Turnbull and Frank Weekly, when they uh, wrote their Atlas of Intestinal Stomas back in 1967, this is how they described a loop uh, colostomy to be matured. So just a little bit of history from the Cleveland Clinic there. And then just the last couple of slides here, what about that shortened mesentery? You're really having trouble, you've mobilized everything, it's, the mesentery is foreshortened and you're really having trouble pulling things up. So one of the things, another maneuver you can consider is something called an end loop stoma. So again, using some type of a uh, loop around the, the loop of bowel, just proximal from the end of your divided bowel, sometimes because that arcade is being pulled down by the mesentery, it, it doesn't afford you the length that you're looking for, but if you come just proximal and bring it up as a loop instead of as direct end, like a, like a chimney, you'll get some extra length on that mesentery. So this is another technique, and this is how it would look if you've you know, completed that maturing. This is an end loop sto ileostomy versus a colostomy. And then lastly, my last slide is one of the more challenging cases that we deal with is when you have this massively dilated colon, a distal obstruction, whether it be from a rectal mass, and you just need to try to salvage the situation. And you know, you're, you're sort of dealt with trying to bring up two ends of very dilated colon or a loop of dilated colon to divert that patient. Well, one of the techniques that we can do is something called the divided loop stoma. You need to mature that proximal end, but basically by dividing the colon completely in half or the bowel completely in half with a stapler, um, you can bring up that distal limb instead of bringing up completely just the corner to decompress that as a mucus fistula, and you can bring it up through the same opening and, and, and afford yourself a little more length, a little, a little easier time trying to bring up both the proximal end, which will mature, and the distal end, which will only partially mature as a corner up through that, state, or other, through that uh, same aperture. Um, and this technique will, will help you with some of those more challenging, specifically with two dilated loops of colon that you need to bring up through the same, if you're trying to bring up the same opening specifically to avoid two separate openings, uh, colostomy opening and the mucus fistula opening. So this is something I would incorporate in numerous uh, different, different variations. It's not always for dilated colon, but this is another technique to sort of be aware about when you want to decompress that distal limb, but you don't need to mature it completely. Um, so just in summary, again, just some very basic tips and tricks, preoperative marking, just some crude, Get the patient to sort of sit off the edge of the bed, find those skin folds, make a marking. That might help you a lot with that post-op care. Using the upper quadrants, specifically in the, in the abdominally obese patient, you know, fascial openings, clearing that colon of ex excess tissue and try to fully mobilize that colon as best you can when you're really struggling to get that reach. And then knowing those extra maneuvers of the end loop stoma for the short mesentery or even that diverted loop end stoma um, uh, for those tougher cases. And I'm um, happy to take any questions, you know, uh, either now or at the panel. Thank you. Great, Dr. Trunzo. The uh, uh, one question that came up from the audience in the last slide on the right side, you talked about, I don't know if you can bring those back up, with the dilated colon being plicated to make the stoma, 
smaller. I think they're talking about the divided loop where you're maturing the corner and the mucous fistula there. Mm -hmm. if you can uh, uh, talk about share that again. Yeah. Yeah. So that the divide. So applicating it. What is that? You meant? I'm sorry if I misunderstood what you're saying. Yeah, they're they're saying. I think the last slide on the right side, that picture on the right, you had of the matured stoma with the on the proximal loop and with the end uh, with the with the corner being uh, matured. Yep. Here you go. Mm -hmm. So on the right, the question is asking is the is the dilated colon there being plicated like folded on itself to make the proximal end smaller? Or how do you um, no, just describe so, your technique, what you're doing. So my technique for that, so what, so basically it's di completely divided. I know that's it's an illustration, so it's not an exact accurate assessment. Actually, you almost see it a little better in this left slide, quite honestly. You know, you have a basically a completed, completely stapled off distal limb. And then we're taking that corner off. And actually what I'll do is I, you're not, I'm not, um, if you're thinking about like brooking it or raising, I'm not actually raising that up. Um, what I'm going to do in that scenario is I'm going to suture directly to the skin circumferentially. And I actually will sew this uh, opposing layer back to from the matured end to the uh, proximal limb and the distal limb together, just so that those two layers are sewn together where they, where they're sort of, I don't know, kissing or touching. Um, but what you're basically doing is just taking off the distal staple line right through the corner of the bowel, just so you can. I usually just try to keep about a centimeter opening, maybe sometimes two, but about a centimeter opening enough that I can maybe get my pinky in there, just enough to decompress, especially for a very dilated loop. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm answering the question fully. If that's kind I of think so, I think I think the the point that like you talked about, you're doing a essentially the proximal limb is an end colostomy. You take correct. the entire staple line, mm -hmm. and the distal line, you're just cutting off the corner and maturing just a little part of it. So it's a mucous fistula. Um, allowing any excess stuff to drain, especially in that big dilated the decompress colon. retrograde. Yeah, so you want allowing that d distal limb to decompress retrograde, especially this is a good technique if you have someone who's very malnourished. You're worried about that staple, like if you did just divide it and drop it in. You're worried about that that distal limb uh, either blowing out or falling apart, or they have a distal obstruction, and you want to make sure that that distal limb is has a way to um, decompress retrograde. So. This is a way to kind of decompress that non-functional limb without having to bring up two full double barrel limbs up. The proximal is completely a straight up end, and the distal limb is just the corner enough for that muco mucosa, that lumen to be open, sort of as a pop-off valve. So, okay, I see. The, so, Dr. Zach Luzny, so, yeah, no, the, I think the problem is with the picture that you're describing. Uh, you're saying on the proximal side, it looks like it's folded right over here. Oh, uh, here? Oh, yeah. It too... It's not folded. It's no, just mature. I, yeah, don't get too enamored with the folds. It's just an end. It looks... That like bottom it's... left shows a better picture. The bottom left shows the ostium matured better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's really just a, an end stoma. If you look at this black and white image, it kind of would look like this, you know, at, at that D corner. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? The other thing I wanted to ask you, with that... A technique of using the Alexis, yeah, uh, the wound protector. Mm -hmm. Do you ever work when you does it? Do you feel like the big abdominal wall kind of compresses back down once you remove it? Yes, and it kind of kicks things off at all. Yeah, it does, but it 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 will. It does compress around it, but you know you have the so this again this this comes in the fact you've already made a generous fascial opening, and um, what you're doing, especially when you have an obese patient, you're just trying to keep all that tissue out of the way so you you're. You you have no resistance as you're pulling it up through the abdominal wall. I mean that's what you're trying to avoid, with that wound retractor being in there. Whether it compresses down on the colon, I'm not worried about it causing an obstruction of the lumen because of the weight of the tissue surrounding it. Because the opening is there, I, that would be not my concern. Okay, great, Dr. Kishina. Why don't we why don't we move on and, and keep putting the questions? This is awesome. Keep them coming. I'll monitor. We'll get back to at the end of the presentations all these questions. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Tranzo. Those are very helpful tips. I've seen them in action and trust me, those tips will be helpful for you in the future if you ever get into those trouble. Um, next is going to be Kate Warner. She's going to be talking about how to manage a difficult stoma. So usually your wound ask me are going to be your best friend when you situations where the stoma is not what it should be. All right, Kate, you're up. One, thanks for the opportunity for uh, me speaking this evening. Share my screen here.
Is my slide, are my slides up? Can everyone see my slides? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm Kate, I'm the inpatient nurse practitioner here at Fairview Hospital for our colorectal surgery team. Um, so what can we do um, at the bedside to help, you know, with these difficult stoma patients? What can we do to really change, you know, their post-op course? How can we avoid prolonged length of stays due to complications, avoid readmission because of ostomy leaking and pain and discomfort? Um, we can try to avoid returning to the operating room for revision. We do everything, you know, in our power uh, with the resources we have um, to optimize them. Um, educating the patient um, and their caregivers to um, be successful at home. You know, we start education post up day one in most situations to really get them, you know, comfortable and, you know, so they have they set up for success. Uh, but when they do have a difficult ostomy, you know, how can we help? You know, is there something peristomal that we need to treat? Uh, do we need to change their ostomy pouching system? Is there a technique that they're using uh, that we need to help uh, change or re-educate them? And really sometimes being creative, you know, no two stomas are the same. And sometimes we have to think kind of outside the box to figure out a fix. Uh, and definitely, you know, improving the patient's quality of life. You know, it's really uncomfortable and uh, sometimes painful to have a difficult stoma for these people. Uh, so, so another update, I know Dr. Trenzo spoke about uh, some marking, uh, but this is uh, something that we use at the bedside, you know, preoperatively outpatient as well as inpatient. When you're looking at the abdomen, you want to make sure that the mark that you put on is within the rectus muscle. Try to get it three fingers away from the midline so it's not right up against the midline incision if there is one. Um, avoiding scars, creases, holds, any abdominal wall defects that could potentially affect the pouch adhering afterwards. I always look at them when they're lying, sitting, standing, bending forward, kind of getting into any position uh, that they may be because, you know, patients don't lay in bed for their whole life. They get up and move around and want to be active and uh, live their life. Uh, definitely within the patient's visual field. If they can't see it, they can't take care of it. Um, and something else is uh, talking about clothing. You know, if we put an ostomy mark right where they wear their pant lines or something that they wear on a regular basis, and that will really interfere with their daily life. Uh, so it's getting into some cases now. Um, so this is a patient that came to her post-op appointment and her only concern was nothing will stick and I'm running out of supplies. Uh, she's a post-op diverting ileostomy. Um, she had been home for about two weeks. Home care had been seeing her and uh, trying to help at home. But um, once we got through our initial assessment, we took off the pouch and this is what we found. So from pretty much two o'clock all the way around to 10 o'clock, really severe, denuded, irritated, painful for her um, uh, peristomal tissue. This photo was taken of holding her abdominal wall up. If her abdominal wall was relaxed, the stoma functions basically right down towards the six o'clock position. So any pouch that she would attempt to put on immediately undermined that seal and was leaking. Um, she was changing her pouch probably once a day, if not more. Uh, so she was running out of supplies and she was really in need of some help. So the first thing we did once we took this off was something called Delmaboro soaks. It's over the counter. It's a really wonderful product. It's an astringent to help dry up all of that really wet, denuded skin. Nothing that is that um, irritated is going to uh, be able to have a seal from an ostomy pouch. Um, so we did that for about 15 minutes. After um, we uh, finished with the Damaboro soaks, we did a technique called crusting the peristomal skin. Basically, what that is, is we take ostomy powder um, and we apply it to all of that really uh, reddish uh, denuded tissue. Um, I do it at least once. Uh, this patient required it about two or three times. You apply the powder and then skin prep to help seal in the powder. And I did that until the skin was dry. Um, on top of that, I used a holly adhesive wafer, which is in the bottom right corner of the screen. Um, this is a really uh, gentle skin barrier that um, does adhere to some denuded tissue like this, and it's really uh, gentle and uh, very minimally painful when it's taken off. Um, and it helps uh, the pouch that you eventually put on adhere really nicely also. Um, and on this abdomen, I used a soft convex pouch and an ostomy belt. 
these really large abdomens. This patient's BMI was, I believe, over 35. The belt helps um, one, you know, support the pouch to be pulled up against the abdominal wall and uh, against the stoma, and it kind of takes the weight off of the adhesive and it kind of puts weight on the belt. So the pouch, uh, if it's getting filled, it's not going to pull against the adhesive. It's going to initially uh, pull against the belt. So after a couple, um, uh, I think I saw her about two or three more times, and uh, with these little changes, uh, her skin did improve slowly uh, outpatient, which was nice. So next patient, um, this is an end ileostomy. Um, she really came to her post-op appointment. This was about two-ish weeks after surgery. Initially, she had no complaints, which was surprising because she was holding her abdomen. So once we talked for a little bit, we you know, went to the exam table, took off her pouch, and this is what we found. All of this red tissue on her abdominal wall was very tender, cellulitic, um, very firm, and very uncomfortable for her. Um, she had not been able to do um, much more than a flat pouch at home um, due to pain, um, and she also was complaining about drainage from around her stoma. Um, so once we were looking at her abdomen and gentle pressure in this area, there was some pus that came from the mucocutaneous junction. Um, so we ended up, um, I ended up sending her from the office to the emergency room for IV antibiotics, and we found that she had a peristomal abscess that we were able to drain uh, with an IR drain. And after a couple of days, um, with that infection being, you know, pulled away from the peristomal area and the IV antibiotics, all of this tissue was completely soft, back to normal, um, like a, a really uh, much more comfortable for her. And after that, she had no issues with uh, pouching. But something that's uh, really difficult for some of these patients, if their pouch, if their ostomy is um, kind of flush at the abdominal wall, if you can see here, um, she was functioning right at six o'clock, kind of like at the skin level, and I think right underneath the skin also. Um, if this was an abdomen that did not have any kind of infectious concerns, um, a convex pouch would have been great because it would have pushed the skin down, popped the stoma up, and their, their uh, pouching issues I don't think would have been an issue. Um, but it was so sensitive that she wasn't able to tolerate that. So after uh, the cellulitis was resolved, uh, she had uh, no difficulties. And something else that was helpful was Demoboros, which this will be a trend with these patients. Um, this third patient here, he was an end uh, colostomy. He had been um, discharged to a nursing facility and then um, home for several weeks before he came to his appointment. He had no complaints, but his family had several complaints. Um, they had been helping him change his pouches um, whenever he called for help, but he usually would just keep them on his abdomen for about a week. Um, he didn't change it on a regular basis. He kind of just waited until the pouch fell off. Um, he presented with this to the office. He felt fine um, for what he was saying, but exam, this area was very um, uh, firm and uh, warm to the touch, uh, very sensitive for him. Um, I did some Damaboro soaks in the office. There wasn't any open or weeping skin, um, but we did do Damaboros just, you know, for some comfort. Um, we did prescribe uh, oral steroids for this. This is all really severe peristomal dermatitis. There was no cellulitis. There was no infectious concerns. He was feeling well otherwise. Um, and uh, we, uh, I used something called Cabalon. Uh, this is a waterproof um, topical barrier that goes on this type of skin um, to help the pouch stick. He was, he would have benefited from a convex pouch because the stoma was a little bit more flush with his abdominal wall. Um, but he was adamant that he wanted only a flat pouch, no paste, uh, just for comfort preferences. Um, so that Cavalon actually helped his pouch adhere really nicely. Um, so after, um, we did spend a lot of time re-educating and, you know, really nailing home the importance of if there is any leaking, you have to change it immediately. This, um, irritation all around his colostomy is because the stool had been sitting against his skin and really just irritating it and it's inflamed and, you know, constant exposure to stool on the skin is going to create a reaction like this. So after a couple of sessions, he did um, improve a little bit. Um, this is an inpatient. Um, this is an end ileostomy. Um, 
We were called pretty frequently um, by the bedside nursing staff because the pouch would not stay and it would keep leaking towards the midline wound. Um, she had um, a more urgent uh, ileostomy, so she was not marked. She had a, a BMI of over 40, so her abdominal wall was um, pretty thick. Um, Postoperatively, her mucocutaneous junction started separating within the first couple of days, and it just kind of progressed into this really large peristomal wound that you can see here. It's about a centimeter circumferentially where it separated, and the wound was about four centimeters deep. Um, anything that the nurses would put on just fell off immediately. So whenever you have a peristomal wound like this, not only do we have to find a pouch that will stay, but we also have to treat and to try to heal this peristomal wound um, slowly over time. Um, with smaller mucocutaneous junction wounds, uh, separation wounds, um, we can do something a little bit more um, conservative, like stoma powder to fill in that crease, but this was a very deep um, peristomal wound. So what we used was um, alginate rope. Um, the photo I have here is just regular alginate. The difference between that and the rope, the rope is woven, so when we tucked it down into that peristomal space, um, there was no concern that there would be anything left behind. You can just easily pull the rope out with each change. Um, any space that was not filled with the rope, we um, filled with stoma powder. And then on top of that, we covered it with this Brava ring. Um, that's basically stoma paste in the shape of a ring. You can kind of mold it to the whatever shape you need it uh, to put on top, and then we caulked it with paste around. On top of that, we used a holly adhesive wafer um, in the right uh, lower corner there. We cut a hole in the middle to kind of give that extra, you know, watertight seal on top of that. And then the pouch that we put on was a light convex uh, pouching system. And this was really helpful because once her abdominal wall relaxed, that stoma retracted and it was in a really deep crease. So the convex pouch kind of helped make it a little bit more flush. Um, and we also used a belt to keep it in place. With all of this, we were able to keep the pouch on for about a day each time, which is um, was actually super helpful because they had not been able to keep a pouch on for more than a couple hours. So after several um, days of doing this, uh, we were able to you know, increase it to every two day changes and then every three days and so on and so forth. And she was eventually um, sent to a nursing facility um, with pretty minimal care after a couple days. Uh, this is a patient with a diverting ileostomy. Um, she or, uh, she came to the hospital um, a couple times postoperatively, but the nursing staff kept paging because the pouch kept leaking immediately. So whenever you get a page like that, there's not really a clear reason, you know, why is it leaking? So when we took the pouch off. This is what we saw. Um, on the top, the top left photo was a couple days before the top right photo. Um, the photo on the right, um, the Q-tips that are in those um, cavities, they're about three or four centimeters deep um, peristomally. We had to pack those with um, something called new gauze. It's just basically an antimicrobial gauze to help fill in that defect to help um, start healing it. Um, and then on top of that, we put a holly adhesive wafer to really just create a barrier. So whenever the, it would start leaking and, and start draining, it wouldn't lift the pouch off immediately. She kind of had a, had a different, uh, difficult abdominal wall also. The stoma was in a crease. There were some really deep um, wells at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock. We filled those with strip paste. We also used soft convexity with her, and we were also changing her pouch about every one to two days. Um, she is actually currently admitted, and it looks much, much better. The wounds are a lot more shallow at this point. We're still doing the same wound care, filling in those um, wounds with new gauze. Hopefully, we can just do something much more minimal in the future. Um, this is a patient who has Crohn's disease, and he had a diverting colostomy to help with that, but he presented to the hospital with multiple peristomal abscesses, and this is his ab abdomen after those abscesses were um, uh, drained and debrided. Um, so we treated these basically as like a some type uh, peristomal wound. We put on topical clobetasol, which is a steroid, um, to help 
the heal that wound bed. And on top of that, we use an alginate dressing. What the alginate dressing does, it helps one absorb the fluid uh, that would drain from that wound, but then also keep it a really um, nice moist uh, wound surface to help it to heal. Um, and we were doing that change every single day. Um, he was actually a, a very um, easy to teach patient. After about two lessons, he was able to do all of this care himself. Um, this picture here is what we put on top of those wounds. Um, again, how adhesive. It's another theme with these patients. Uh, this uh, helped seal in those um, wounds. Uh, if you can see how we kind of cut it to fit around the stoma. And I put a light convex uh, pouching system on top of that as well. This last patient here, um, this is a diverting ileostomy. Um, again, another mucocutaneous separation um, wound, but hers is much more shallow compared to the previous one. Um, with this patient, we filled in the um, mucoc mucocutaneous um, wound with stoma powder. Her defect was only about uh, half a centimeter uh, deep. Um, we went through several pouches to find one that would fit. Her abdominal wall was also very thick um, and the peristomal skin was very firm. So <laughs> any uh, pouch that we put on that was not soft and moldable, it just popped right off whenever she would move. Um, so we eventually settled on a Marlin pouch, which is a specialty pouch. It's really great for it's really firm abdominal walls. Her stoma was also in a crease. Um, so we filled in the uh, wound with some powder. Again, used holly adhesive to seal it in, used stoma paste to caulk all of the um, seams, and then we put on the Marlin pouch, and she actually did fairly well with that. Um, she's someone that we had to educate on a frequent basis and also engage some family support. Uh, she would have benefited from a nursing facility, but she was uh, uh, adamant about going home, so we did everything we can to kind of tear up for success at home. So just some uh, key takeaways from a couple of these uh, post-op patients. Just know your resources that you have at your disposal um, and products that you can you know, try to use and uh, change. If the pouch is leaking, I always tell the bedside nursing staff, change it immediately. If you know any effluent sits on the skin, it starts to break it down, then you start to get these really terrible wounds. Um, think outside the box, be creative. Like I said initially, there's no, stoma, there's no two stomas that are the same. Educate the patient and their family early and often, and always know how to call your stoma nurse. All right, thank you so much, Kate. That was very educational. It's impressive to see the situation you can salvage with a great wound care. And for those uh, I didn't mention previously, Kate is actually an inpatient, outpatient uh, nurse practitioner, part of the colorectal team. So it's nice to have someone from the colorectal team who deals with this, who also understands the pathology. So I think just something to consider. Uh, so, finally, we have Dr. Barma. She's going to be talking about operative, uh, in the, you know, situations where you cannot salvage the ostomy and you will need to um, provide operative intervention. You're up, Dr. Barma. Thank you. So, I think you're going to see a lot of recurring themes um, in my talk from the two talks you just heard. So, I have no financial disclosures, but as Kate just mentioned, a great wound ostomy nurse can really save your stoma. And so, I always recommend that you ask them for help because um, you may not need to take patients to the operating room um, if they can if they can salvage it. The other thing is that I'm not going to address peristomal hernias. We're very fortunate here that we have an abdominal wall reconstruction team um, that tends to to correct those. Um, but keep in mind that peristomal hernias can be related to some of these complications that I'm going to talk about. So. We talk about with the perfect stoma. We teach our residents and fellows that you want it to be pink, productive, prolapsing, and perfused. Um, but you also want it to be easy to see, easy to pouch, and have successful pouching. So what is the difficult stoma then? There are several situations where you may need to have uh, operative intervention um, because your stoma isn't quite so perfect. And I'm gonna talk about each of these um, one by one. So ischemia, prolapse, stenosis, retraction, poor placement, and then just a note on um, mucosal implantation and also um, mucocutaneous separation. 
So just starting off with ischemia, one thing that's really important to know is when to recognize ischemia. So this stoma is actually not ischemic. This is venous congestion. And the way that you can tell, um, if you look really closely in the picture, it looks like it might be dead. But when you look really closely, you can see that there's actually a layer of pink um, kind of deep to this. But if that doesn't work, you can always do the test tube um, test where you take a test tube, put it in the stoma and shine a light through it and see where um, it starts to pink up. Now, this next stoma, this is ischemic. This stoma is completely dead. Um, so this is the kind of ostomy that you definitely are going to need to revise in the operating room. So why did this stoma die? There's a lot of things you can control and a lot of things you can't control. And like Dr. Trunzo mentioned, things like the patient's body habitus, the thick and foreshortened mes mesentery, and a distended colon are things that you can't always control. But things that you can typically control in the operating room is the choice of location. So for this particular patient, what would what would you do? I, so what we did was we took the patient back to the operating room and we assessed the level of ischemia. So this is a patient who had a sigmoid colectomy, Hartman's procedure, and then came into clinic at 4 p.m. for their post-op, and this is what we saw. Um, but So clearly you can tell that this part is necrotic. So this part was um, transected. And then we did a scope actually to look inside um, and try to salvage it. And for this particular patient, we were able to bring it up and salvage it. However, if we weren't able to, and if the ischemia is going deep into the abdomen, you probably need to exlac this person. Um, or if you did it minimally invasive, go back in laparoscopically and go through all of those tricks that Dr. Tronzo just spoke about with all of the mobilization. So this is based, this slide is basically just a very brief summary of what Dr. Um, Tronzo talked about. Mobilization, um, you can create windows in the mesentery, uh, making the aperture large enough to allow that thickened colon and mesentery to come through and taking off that epipoic appendages, choosing a different location, in very rare occasions, you can consider an anastomosis, um, and you may want to consider an ileostomy as well. So the next thing I want to talk about is prolapse. So you can see that there are two different kinds of prolapse here, and these are two different situations. This is a loop colostomy that prolapsed at the distal end, and this is an endileostomy that prolapsed not, not too bad, just a little bit. So when it comes to prolapse, if the stoma is pouchable and it's not causing issues, then leave it alone. So the issues that it can cause bleeding, and that's often from the pouch rubbing along, alongside of it, um, and then, of course, getting a good seal. But if you have to operate, what I would recommend is making an incision just right at that mucocutaneous junction and try not to enlarge the aperture if you can avoid it. And what I would do is excise the excess and then remature it. Um, if the aperture is too large, you can always make it smaller. And this is an example of an ostomy where the aperture was too large. And you can see here there's a vertical, there's an incision that we had to make smaller. And I always put this incision cephalad to the stoma so that way stool won't leak onto it, hopefully. And I actually switched from using um, absorbable suture to using uh, nylon suture because I noticed that these had a tendency to absorb pretty quickly and then ulcerate, making the pouching harder. But with the um, non-absorbable suture, it ended up healing a lot better. It does create an extra step where you have to go in and remove those sutures when they come back to clinic, but I found that it's, it works pretty well. So one thing that when it comes to prolapse, you can always try to reduce it, but something like this is going to need an operation. This is going to be very challenging to reduce. It looks like the proximal side of this is okay, and it's the distal side that's going to need to be um, resected. And so what you want to do is resect the redundant uh, colon. This is probably associated with a peristomal hernia, and you want to fix that hernia, typically just with interrupted uh, sutures um, and do it primarily because this is probably not the time to be putting in mesh 
And then you can always convert from a loop to an end. And don't forget about distal obstruction, like Dr. Trunzo mentioned, and you can always do a mucus fistula or implant the stump. So I know Dr. Trunzo showed that double barrel. This is another way that you can implant the stump um, above the fascia um, if you feel that um, it won't reach the same aperture because you had to resect more. So remember this, dead stoma over here. So unfortunately, after that was taken back to the operating room and revised, it did result in stenosis. And you can see here, it was a very tiny aperture. And this is usually the result of ischemia or mechanical issues. And it can also be related to smoking. That's a really big factor when it comes to ostomy stenosis. So what we did for this patient was in office dilation. And typically you have to do this repeatedly. And what I will do is I will gently try to dilate this using a, a finger. And I usually start with a tiny little pinky finger using lidocaine jelly um, and try to get it, you know, uh, big enough to accommodate an index finger. Um, if the patient is tender, I'll inject around it with lidocaine. And you can use Hagar dilators, but only to dilate the skin because the dilators, if you try to go past the fascia, it can cause bowel perforation. And then we're dealing with a completely different situation. So um, if there is fascial stenosis, I do not recommend trying to dilate um, in the office. You can try to take a look endoscopically um, or operative revision. And always ask yourself, can this stoma be reversed? So here is a picture of that stoma after it was revised. We dilated it um, serially for a few weeks and then got her to the operating room and was able to revise it real nicely there. Um, one of the things oops, you may need to do is revise it before reversal, um, just to allow for preoperative optimization. Um, and just take care to avoid making the aperture too large. I know that I've had situations where a stoma is stenotic and then I kind of overshoot and make it a little too big and then I have to put in those sutures like I mentioned. Another thing um, that can happen is retraction. And I find that when you have a stoma that's retracted, you need to ask yourself why it's retracted. And this can be due to multiple things. So one is inadequate mobilization or body habitus. And so this is the stoma that is just had the colon hasn't been mobilized. It's not coming up and prolapsing nicely. Um, you aren't able to brook it. Now for colostomies, it may be okay to have a flush stoma. A lot of people make their stomas flush um, from the get go. Um, I like to brook my stomas, but um, but when it's an ileostomy, having a flush retracted stoma is not um, going to be good for pouching, like you saw in the, the last presentation. The other thing that can contribute is a hernia. And then another thing to consider are adhesions. So it's possible that as the patient is healing after this index operation, that they're forming adhesions that then can pull down on the ostomy, causing it to retract. And I've definitely had patients who... I have seen that and had to take them simply for an adhesiolysis and rematuring of their stoma. So when you try to fix these, you can always try local repair because if that's possible, that's the you know least um, aggressive way and it typically can get the job done. Um, but again, under, try to identify the underlying cause. And if you did this operation minimally invasive, um, or even if let's say this isn't a patient that you operated on before, you can always try to do this in a minimally invasive fashion to identify what's going on and um, try to, to get it so it's prolapsed nicely again. And so similar to ischemia, you wanna follow all of those same principles that Dr. Trun Dr. Trunzo talked about to get good mobilization. So, one of the last things I want to talk about is poor placement. So this patient um, was actually transferred to us from out of state, and he had a 
single stage J pouch and then leaked and the ostomy was brought up through his midline. And when he presented to us, this is what his, the quality of his skin looked like. With really great attention from our ostomy team, he was able to get his skin to recover. Um, and this was with daily stoma bag changes. And what we ended up doing um, for him was eventually we ensured that the leak was, um, was healed and we were able to reverse the stoma. But a, Typically, you don't want to put a stoma in the lower midline, especially you can see this patient has all these uh, these creases and folds. Probably for this patient, it would have been better to go a little more proximal and put it um, in a better site, um, similar to what Dr. Trenzo um, had mentioned. Those pictures he showed with the patient sitting upright, I think in this patient would have really shown where the stoma could sit nicely. Um, so another thing you can try if the stoma is in a bad place, but you want to get them to um, get them further out so that you can do definitive uh, reversal. You can try different pouching systems, hernia belts, binders, and working really closely with your wound ostomy nurses. Another thing um, to mention is mucosal implantation. And so this can happen when you take those stitches. This is why we always teach our fellows when they take the stitches, they need to come out just under the epidermis and only take dermis because you can get mucosal implantation. You can see this happened all the way around. And then that can kind of also uh, spread out laterally, uh, radially from the stoma. So one of the things we always try is silver nitrate um, and other pouching changes to see if that can help. But otherwise, what we do, I really try to make an incision very close to the mucocutaneous junction, excise this mucosal implantation, and then make sure to keep those new sutures um, in the dermis and not through the epidermis. So finally, the last thing I want to talk about, um, which Kate already touched on, is mucocutaneous separation. So I think it's important to note that typically operative intervention will not improve this mucocutaneous separation and it will likely recur. Um, the reason for that is that this skin is just really friable. It's not going to hold a stitch really well. And you don't want to excise it because then you're going to have a stoma aperture that's way too large for that stoma and it may break down as well. So in a situation like this, working really closely with your wound ostomy nurses will um, will really get this patient to where they need to be. And I would say a majority of the time, um, these uh, heal without any operative intervention. So just some takeaway points. Um, operative intervention for stoma complications is not uncommon. Um, and these are some of the the surgical options that you can use, um, but definitely exhaust your non-operative management first. Um, your wound ostomy nurses can be not only your hero, but your patient's hero as well. And don't forget to consider reversal. It may be better to reverse a colostomy and give them a loop, a nice loop ileostomy, which you can reverse down the line, rather than continuing to try to make a poor colostomy continue to function. Thank you so much. Amazing. Great presentation, Dr. Bama. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentations from all three of our presenters. Um, some questions are coming through the chat and keep those uh, going. Um, as Dr. Bama highlighted, it's we're so lucky to have an amazing wound ostomy uh, care team. You know, out here on the west side to have someone like Kate that's so knowledgeable, as you saw from her presentation, to help take care of our uh, patients with all the problems we make for her with these stomas that we create. So one question that came through, Kate talked about if you had a concurrent midline wound infection then with a stoma, and then so obviously to treat the midline wound infection, you have to open that midline. There's a mention in the comment about can you drain it through the stoma, but in general, those should be two separate uh, incisions, so there really shouldn't be a way to connect it. So it's always better to drain it out the midline. Does that ruin your day? Like, is that How much harder does that make to pouch and any techniques when you have an open midline that you're doing wet the dries on? Um, honestly, it, if, for example, if we had to open up the whole midline and it's 
you know, a, like a wound vac situation that actually makes ostomy care a lot more easy for me and anyone who's caring for them. Because once the wound vac is on, the pouch can go right on like the edge of that um, uh, dressing and it's it's actually a lot like more closed situation. So I prefer when if things if there is an infection that it's kind of opened up and, you know, it's treated that way. Great. Another question here for you. I've never heard about this. Maybe you have someone asking if there's a role for over the counter Flonase or nasal spray for inflamed peristomal skin. Um, I have never heard of it, but I can kind of understand the thought process. But I, I've never heard of that. You keep your Flonase in your nose, is what you're saying. Yes. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, what I want to do is with the remaining 15 minutes or so. Uh, we have some cases to go through that Dr. Kashindra is going to uh, present. Um, keep the questions coming if you got them. I think either responding in the chat or here we got through uh, all of them. And um, but we're going to go through these cases and I'm going to try to stump this panel and see what they would do in these challenging situations. So I'm just going to get through some of the give a little background on some of these cases and then we're going to. Throw some questions to our panelists. So this is a first case is a 69 year old woman who presented an emergency room after a fall. She reported a few weeks of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. She had a CT scan that was done that showed a pretty large obstructing right sided pelvic mass. It had involvement of the terminal ileum and right colon, so uh, causing obstruction there. And also she had right hydronephrosis because the ureter was also obstructed. And then, in addition, she a BMI was 28.5, but most of it was in the belly. So she had central obesity and her abdominal wall thickness was about six centimeters. Her pre I mean, albumin was 3.2. Intraoperatively, uh, based on the nature of what was encountered, uh, so she had a very large primary mass at the ileocecal valve um, that was also tethering the sigmoid colon, but thankfully there was no evidence of large bowel obstruction. She also had diffuse carcinomatosis with involvement of the small bowel and uh, uh, the lower abdominal wall. So she ended up getting, uh, in this situation, a diverting loop me to deal with her, obstruct her obstruction. On post up day two, she developed the mucous cutaneous uh, junction separation on the right lateral side. And again, because of a thick abdominal wall, she ended up with a pocket next to it and developed cellulitis as well. So, kind of stopping there for a second. All right, great. So, um, challenging case to begin with, and now you've got an ostomy on day two with what Dr. Kashin was calling cellulitis. That's, we're sure that's not just rapid pyoderma or denuding or anything like that. And Dr. Trunza, when you take a look at this uh, ostomy, you see that, you know, there's some bilious effluent there leaking around the side you see the cellulitis what do you what do you start to think about well you think it's you start worrying about it being retracted and that stool is sort of undermining the skin and you're getting probably you know you're getting some direct contamination under the abdominal wall and that in that short period of time you're worried about that sort of starting to get underneath and that's why you're, you what you're seeing at the surface maybe there may be a lot more going on under the surface because then you worry about if it's getting under the skin here, is it going to start getting below the fascia? Right. So, Dr. Bama, um, what are your thoughts then of how you would uh, then proceed? I mean, you got this. Is there something that we need to investigate? Is imaging going to help you at this point? Do you need to do something surgically? Are there local or topical options? How would you start addressing this? So another thing I would worry about is if there's possibly a miscenterotomy that is above the fascia, which hopefully not, but I, you know, it's it's happened. Um, so I think taking a really good look at this with your stoma nurses, suctioning all of that out and trying to identify where that succus is actually coming from can right then and there just on physical exam you may be able to determine it if you can't like if you're if you're still kind of stumped i think either i don't know if necessarily a cat scan is going to help unless you see a lot of intra-abdominal fluid you can always try some contrast studies but i would bet nine times out of ten you'll be able to figure it out on physical exam without imaging i think that's a great point that you bring up that you know we see the you can see the mucocutaneous junction but you don't know if that's kind of the cause or the effect of the stool leaking back down there. Is it coming out the ostomy and leaking back down? Or like you said, could there be some type of 
enterotomy or something uh, more proximal on the stoma, but still above the fascia, that it's leaking out. So you got to figure out which direction it, it it comes from. Kate, when looking at this and examining this uh, bedside, how easy is it, especially on these uh, obese patients, to try to figure out exactly where it's coming from? Do you have any tips of how you uh, uh, clean it up and retract things and anything that you do when we work with you to try to figure this out bedside? Whenever I see a lot of stool next to a stoma like that, um, it's either refluxing down into that cavity or coming from up from that cavity. So sometimes I just take the pouch off and just watch it for a couple minutes because whenever you see the stoma function, you'll see exactly where it's coming from. So if it's coming from the os, you know, that's uh, one thing that I think is maybe refluxing down into the cavity. But if it's coming from up in that cavity, is there something, you know, down within there that's a uh, concern? Great, absolutely. All right, Dr. Cushino, what happened All right. next? So those are uh, questions. And um, as uh, pointed out, um, I mean, this in this situation, patient continued to have difficulty with the pouch in, and with some bedside investigation, um, it was noted that she had a fistula or enterotomy on the lateral side, and this was because uh, at the site of a prior broken suture that kind of tore through. So, of note, her pathology showed that she had metastatic poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation and would need chemotherapy. Right now, we are post update five. So, what are uh, options? So, I guess we'll start with Dr. Bama. Sorry about that. So, if you can get that stoma to come up a little bit better. You may be able to rebrook it. Um, you may be able to fix that um, that like enterotomy, um, but I think as long as it's not going down underneath into the fascia, you still may be able to get it to heal with local uh, stoma care. Dr. Trenzo, what do you think? You agree? You're gonna yeah, first I, attempt local care here? Do you? I what do you think, think if I could, and you could see. I mean, if you the, if it's from. Uh, a sort of brook suture that sort of tore through and you see a hole in the side wall at the, you know, at the level of the fat, a skin level or just below the skin level, you may be able to locally revise that without having to, so you're getting back in her abdomen and re maturing the stoma may not be that easy to do, but you may be able to locally manage it. And then even if there's a little bit of a fistula sort of poking through at the surface, you, you may still be able to salvage the the stoma without having to completely take it down. I guess during that time frame, you kind of see how are you managing this ostomy? Is it is it is it you know the skin coming apart? You can't keep pouches on, and then that that'll help sort of determine where you're going to be. Because as it turns, you know, unfortunately, she's going to be having this ostomy quite a quite some time, maybe indefinitely with her pathology. Yeah, very very great point, and. Um, as you mentioned, with this situation, a uh, patient continues to have difficulty with pouching. Her infection wasn't quite clear enough, so she had to get a local revision. Um, and with the pocket next to it, um, that was debrided as much as possible. A drain was left in that pocket, kind of coming out lateral to the where the appliance would be. So there's always kind of always thinking about that cavity because you're gonna have a big space right next to your ostomy where that fluid had been accumulating. So that would need to be cleaned out and um, drained as well. Right. Any this is a great this is a great time. I remember that uh, when we were discussing this case, great to involve our ostomy nurses to work with them to think about, okay, if you have this big cavity, this abscess cavity next to your ostomy, where is the best place to drain that to assist with pouching? Do you want to drain it immediately next to the stoma? So theoretically something might empty into the bag, or do you want to drain it laterally to get it away so you have room to pouch? Knowing that, you know, and try to get that cavity to close on down without creating uh, any type of fistula thing. And they they said lateral there um, was the way that helped the best. Is that right, uh, Dr. Kishinro? Uh, correct. All okay. right, great. So that's the first case. Any other comments uh, from our panelists or Dr. Rosen? I think this is perfect on time. I think let's go on to the next one. All right. So we have one more case. Um, in this situation, this was a 58 year old gentleman who presented to the emergency room with severe abdominal pain. He reported 2 months of altered 
bowel habits. So he's been having progressive constipation with occasional diarrhea. And he also reports a 20 pound weight loss. He's never had a colonoscopy. He's an active smoker of 1.5 packs per day. And his BMI is 18. Um, his scan showed he had pneumoperitonea with a large bowel obstruction at his retrosigmoid colon um, due to some mural thickening. So it could be cancer, could be stricture from diverticular disease. However, he had multiple liver lesions concerning for METs, and then his site of perforation is not easily identified on the CT scan. So a patient was taken to the operative room, operative room, operating room and um, intraoperatively had severely distended and dilated colon due to an obstructing upper rectal mass. He had diffused purulent fluid with perforation on the medial side of the tumor. The tumor had involved the pelvic structures and he also had peritoneal and liver disease. So I'll pause there. We'll throw the question out to our surgeons in the group, Dr. Barmer, Dr. Tronzo. Yeah, so a difficult situation to make sure I'm understanding it. You've got an upper rectal intraperitoneal perforation of this tumor. It's not extraperitoneal, it's intraperitoneal. And so you need to address that. And also that mass itself is locally invading into like lateral pelvic structures. Is that what you mean by invading? Yeah, and the bladder. And the bladder. So certainly not something you can easily just chip out and right. Because I think if we had a perforation in general, you're, you know, say it was a sigmoid colon perforation, you'd want to resect it and do an end colostomy typically in those situations. Patients sick, definitely gonna need chemotherapy post-operatively. But now you've got a hole that you can't fix with sutures. It's tough to just to to remove any of it because it's involving these other structures. You can't. You know, you're not trying to do an on block uh, exenteration with lateral pelvic stuff. So, difficult situation. Dr. Trunzo, I'm glad that I am the question asker. <laughs> you are the one that has to answer what you would do in this situation. So, what do you think? Yeah, this, this scenario, unfortunately, we, we run into this time and again uh, the perforated tumor that's not, whether it's up rectosigmoid or just above the perineal reflection, it's really not resectable. The primary operation, and you're trying to do some damage control. Um, you know, you have an obstruction. You know, ideally, um, and this came a little bit in the discussion. Uh, you know, where do you bring? She he needs to be proximally diverted. And if I can, if there's mobility of the sigmoid colon, I would bring up a loop sigmoid colostomy, and then drain this area and try to control the perforation because you really can't do much with the tumor. You can't take it out. You tried to if you tried. Doing some heroic thing to resect that, you will find yourself in a in a rabbit's hole that will never end, and it's not easy because they will sort of have a protracted course of sort of pelvic sepsis that'll not be easy to manage. But really, you're sort of stuck. This is a bad situation, but proximal diversion and drainage washout, and that would be my move here. And if I can do sigmoid colon, that's what I prefer because if they did get to the point where they had an opportunity for definitive resection, we can take out that. Sigmoid with a, a, the oncologic resection, the colostomy, the primary tumor, and then bring things down and reconstruct from the descending colon down. And what do you do with that big dilated colon that Dr. Kashino is describing here? Like when you're making your clear, you got a sigmoid colostomy, you got two big loops coming up that are just huge and dilated from this obstruction. Mm -hmm. You make your fascia, you're making a huge fascia because I mean, you got to do that to fit that up. This maybe you bring in your divided loop idea, or yeah, this is, decompress this is, it at all, either yeah. after you bring it through the fascia or before, and risk spilling that all in the in the abdomen. What do you do there? Yeah, I, I this would be a good opportunity to do a divided end. I, you know, I think sometimes, you know, trying to bring up two separate things, uh, two divided separate lumens or separate apertures, is not always so easy in these scenarios. Um, but if I if I had to choose in this in this particular space where I did have a very distal or very dilated colon, it's nice to try to divide it, bring that corner because you do need to decompress that distal limb. You know they're obstructed there, and you want to have decompression between your ostomy and your obstruction so that the mucus fistula can decompress that sort of floating segment between. So we got to vote for a, a, a sigmoid colostomy, potentially a divided loop. Dr. Bama, what, what's your assessment? What would you do with this case? I think we can barely hear you. I think you got to speak closer or. I 
think I can close. No? No, I can barely hear you. I think your mic might have been. Huh? Just, no, just very soft. Huh. If you click on the carrot next to your mute button and go to audio settings, you can go to your microphone and turn up your microphone volume. Dr. Kashina, why don't you bring us to the next slide while Dr. Baum is doing this, and then uh, we'll, we'll get back to her. Yeah, so in terms of options for in this situation, just to kind of quickly go over some of it, loop colostomy, like Dr. Tronzo mentioned, but again, if the colon is really dilated and you can't bring that through your aperture, then, you know, doing the end colostomy with the mucous fistula, a blowhole is always a good one. And sometimes doing, doing a diverting loop ileostomy is also a good uh, option if the ileocecal valve is incompetent. And then if it's resectable, always resection with end colostomy also is a good option. So, um, unfortunately, on post update three, this patient was having abdominal pain with leukocytosis. He had two collections on a CT scan shown on the picture to the right. What did you do? What, what was your answer? What did you do? Oh, in, yes. In this situation, oh. <laughs> the patient got an end colostomy with a mucus fistula. So, a divide, you know, divided. Uh, Body loop. Through the same aperture? Is that how you did it? Through the same aperture, yes. Okay. All right. Um, so the patient had two collections, um, as the arrow shows them, the, the mucus, uh, mucus, uh, mucus, the mucus fistula staple line was at the fascia level. Uh, I placed the drain in those collection and it came back as speculant. At this point, I'd like to say, what would you be worried about? Because uh, that we're would just, be we're just about out of time. Why don't you bring uh, us through what you found here? Okay. Well, you know, in this situation, is always worry about misperforation because you know initially the thought it was from the uh, from the cancer, but maybe the cecal was perforated, maybe it was missed. Um, any other site of perforation, staple line dehiscence from the mucus fistula, or still more mucus uh, mucus fistula retraction. So the patient was taken back to the operating room. Unfortunately, they had a mucus fistula retraction on the lateral side uh, with some localized feculent peritonitis, and the stump was still pretty dilated and still uh, still filled. And about one third of the staple line had dehisced. So in this situation, um, the patient had received, um, recited the mucus fistula to uh, super pubic region. Um, so we stapled, recite, and then uh, we matured into a mucus fistula. Yeah. Uh, another thing to think about is, you know, you can try to put a tube in it to make it a control fistula. Really tough case. Oftentimes with these, uh, whether it's the mucus fistula side of things or the proximal ostomy. You want to make sure you have more length than you think you would need, especially in these obstructed cases. The stool sitting there is so heavy and just pulls down and really can uh, cause retraction. I've had that same thing happen to me, and it's a really tough uh, complication. I think you you handled that great. The you know there's one last question about a transverse colostomy if the patient is very sick and a sigmoid mesentery is foreshortened. Great option. We try to avoid transverse colostomies if we can have a left-sided colostomy reach. Just they tend to be a little bit better. They prolapse less, fewer complications. But absolutely, a transverse colostomy is a is the next option, kind of after if you can't. I think uh, they're mentioning a Turnbull blowhole. So a oh, blowhole. I think yes. I think that's what they're referencing here with that the the the, the, guess yeah. the, the chat box. So yes, a blowhole where you pull up so, you know just a little bit of the wall of sort of the transverse and mature that open that that the blowhole colostomy maybe more than anything causes very strong opinions one way or another from colorectal surgeons. And so you have people that think it's a great option. You have people that think it's a terrible option. But yes, it's absolutely something to have in the armamentarium. You can still prolapse through that, uh, even though you're just doing a little blowhole. But it is something that can get you out of dodge and buy you some time in a, in a, in a situation. I would only comment that, that that works. That's a workable situation in a patient that has a reasonable abdominal wall thickness. If their abdominal wall is wide and thick, you're going to have a hard time bringing that up to the skin level. For a thin patient like this one was with a BMI of 18, you can salvage a situation with a blowhole if that's your only move. All right, Steve, why don't you bring us to the wrap up slides? I want to thank our panel for a great discussion. Um, thank Dr. Kashino for wonderful cases and great moderation. Someone asked about this being recorded. It is recorded and available on our website. You can email us if you can't find that or need more details. Please join us for our upcoming programs on December 11th, 2024. We have emerging trends in gastroenterology. Then on January 10th, 2025, we have our 10th annual multidisciplinary colorectal oncology event in Cleveland, Ohio. 
January is a beautiful time to visit Cleveland, and you should definitely be involved uh, with that conference. With that, I want to thank everybody for making the difficult stoma an easy stoma. We know everybody on this chat, on this webcast, is able to do all stomas, left, right, small bowel, large bowel. Uh, and thanks again for joining us here at Cleveland Clinic, and we'll see you next time on Live from Cleveland Clinic.